Welcome back to Student to Stud. Today, we're going to cover proximal humerus fractures. First, we're going to start with a case. Say you have a 68-year-old female that presents to the emergency department after a motor vehicle accident. The resident's currently in surgery and asks you to read him the x-rays. What would you say? You'd say you have three views of the right shoulder and a skeletally mature individual demonstrating a four-part fractured dislocation of the proximal humerus. Now, in this lecture, we're going to cover the anatomy of this fracture pattern, the classification systems, ED management, and definitive treatment. So let's get started. To understand proximal humerus fractures, you must understand some basic anatomy surrounding the shoulder. First, we will talk about the bony anatomy. The proximal humerus is composed of various parts and regions. There is the anatomic neck, which is the location of the epiphyseal plate, the surgical neck, and then the four segments or parts of the proximal humerus, which are the articular surface, greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity, and the shaft. Now, the humerus, unlike the femur, is actually retroverted between 35 and 40 degrees, and the normal neck shaft angle is 135 degrees. The blood supply is very important, and knowing this is very high yield. So we have our subclavian artery that transitions into the axillary artery after it crosses the first rib. Now, there's a lot of branches that come off of the subclavian and axillary arteries, but we aren't going to concern ourselves with those right now. You want to know the anterior circumflex artery, which gives branch to the arcuate artery, and the posterior circumflex artery. But why is knowing the blood supply so crucial in proximal humerus fractures? Well, proximal humerus fractures are at a higher risk for avascular necrosis, and if the major blood supply is disrupted, which is the posterior humeral circumflex artery, then we run the risk of avascular necrosis. And there's also a criteria that can predict our risk of humeral head ischemia, and this is called the hurdle criteria. If a proximal humerus fracture has less than eight millimeters of calcar length attached to the articular surface, a disrupted medial hinge, and a humeral head angulation and or head split fracture, these all increase the risk of humeral head ischemia. And going from top to bottom is going to go from the greatest to the least predictor of humeral head ischemia. And if there's any combination of the patterns above, there's actually up to a 97% predicting rate of humeral head ischemia. However, if you have a basic fracture pattern, less angulation, and you have greater than eight millimeters of calcar length, these are good prognostic indicators that the humeral head will not have ischemia. Now let's go over some muscle anatomy. Knowing the muscle insertions on the proximal humerus and their innervations is very high yield. The muscles that insert on the greater tuberosity are the teres minor, the infraspinatus, and the supraspinatus. The supraspinatus and infraspinatus are both innervated by the suprascapular nerve, where the teres minor is actually innervated by a branch of the axillary nerve. Now, the subscapularis inserts on the lesser tuberosity and is innervated by the upper and lower subscapular nerve. Lastly, is going to be the intertubricular groove insertions of the pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, and the teres major. Now, the pec major is innervated by the medial and lateral pectoral nerves. The lat is innervated by the thoracodorsal nerve, and the teres major is innervated by the lower subscapular nerve and thoracodorsal nerve. Now, why is it important knowing muscle insertions? Well, as you can see by the drawing, there's going to be some muscles that deform the fracture. Now, the greater tuberosity is going to be pulled superiorly and posteriorly, and it's going to externally rotate the greater tuberosity. The subscapularis internally rotates the lesser tuberosity, and the muscles that will be inserting on the intertubercular groove is going to displace the shaft anteriorly and medially. So knowing these help to predict uh, typical fracture patterns that happen around the proximal humerus. Now, here's a basic anatomy slide, but it's great pimp fodder. Do you know the borders that make up the quadrangular space, the triangular interval, and the triangular space? Well, the borders of the quadrangular space is outlined by the teres minor, teres major, the long head of the triceps, and the humeral shaft. The triangular interval is going to be outlined by the teres major, long head, of the triceps and the humeral shaft. And lastly, the triangular space is going to be outlined by the teres minor, teres major, and long head of the triceps. But now do you know which goes through each? 
So the quadrangular space is going to contain the axillary artery and the posterior circumflex humeral artery. The triangular interval has the radial nerve and the profunda brachii artery. And the triangular space has a circumflex artery. Now if you get mixed up between which is the interval and which is the space for the triangular interval and space, just remember that triangular space, the S in space, is the same as the S in scapula. And the only thing going through the triangular space is the circumflex scapular artery. What's going to be the typical presentation of the patient that's going to come in? Well, it's majority of the time it's going to be an elderly person uh, greater than the age of 50, and more often than not, it's going to be a female. Now, the mechanism of injury is very important. Uh, typically, in older patients, it's going to be a fall from standing height. And if this happens in younger patients, it's going to be fall from a greater height, uh, motor vehicle accident, or athletic injuries. So I think mean, that's going to have a lot more higher energy to fracture a proximal humerus in a younger patient than in an older patient. When you're evaluating the patient in the emergency department, it's very important that you get a good, thorough history. There are certain aspects of the patient's history that are very important to ascertain when gathering their history. First is the energy of the trauma, because a ground level fall versus falling off the roof are to two totally different management pathways. You should also ask about any other fractures that happened in the past, such as distal radius or femoral neck fractures, because this could clue you into that the patient may have osteoporosis, and you may want to work them up for that. One of the last things is the patient's prior level of function pre before this injury. Did they ever have pain in the shoulder before? Have they had arthritis in the shoulder? Have they had rotator cuff issues that hinder their ability to use their arm? All these questions are important because it could dictate which treatment option you're going to lean towards in the end. Now, getting a good history is important, but next, you want to get a very good physical exam. Start with inspection of the affected arm. Look for how it's being held. Is there any deformities? Is there ecchymosis? Are there other injuries? Especially if this is going to be a higher energy mechanism, you want to look at the clavicle. Look at the surrounding structures. Make sure other uh, extremities aren't affected. You also want to palpate. They're going to be very tender to palpation, but just make sure there's also not an associated clavicle or scapular fracture. They're pretty much going to be too painful to move for a range of motion, so you're not going to be able to get a good assessment from that. Now, getting a good neurovascular exam is also very important. Testing for the axillary nerve, the most sensitive exam is going to be to see if they can contract their muscle. They're probably going to be too painful to move it, but if, even if you could feel a twitch in the deltoid, that's better than nothing. But you also want to test their sensation over the lateral aspect of their deltoid to see if it's intact because that's the most common nerve that's going to be injured in these types of fractures. You also want to test the other nerves, the upper extremity. You test the median nerve through the AIN by doing the AOK -okay sign, the radial nerve through the PIN doing a thumbs up, and the ulnar nerve by doing crossing fingers. This is called testing for the cardinal hand movements. And then lastly, check their radial and ulnar arteries. So what is the minimum required imaging of these fractures? Well, you need your four standard views of the shoulder. You need your AP, Grashi, scapular Y, and axillary. Do you know what makes a Grashi view different than an AP? Well, the patient's actually going to be turned 30 to 45 degrees toward the affected side, and the arm is going to be more internally rotated. This gives the best view of the glenohumeral joint. So here, you know, we have the Grashi, the AP, scapular Y, and axillary views. Now, do you know why we would get an axillary view? Well, we wanna make sure there's not gonna be an associated dislocation because if it's a very high energy fracture, there are times that you get a fracture dislocation, so you need to make sure to rule that out. But what if the patient's too painful to move their shoulder to get an axillary view? What's the name of an alternative view that we can get? It's called the Velpo. The Velpo view will help us get a similar view as an axillary, but all the patient has to do is sit upright and we can actually take a image going from superior to inferior shooting through the joint. You can also get a West Point axillary, which is gonna be looking at the anterior glenoid looking for a bony bank heart. And this is important, especially if you have a dislocation associated with the fracture. You can get a CT scan, especially if it's a fracture that has multiple parts. You want to look at, see if there's any articular involvement looking for head split fractures, because remember, it's important to see for head split 
because of a humeral head ischemia. And you want to look at the extent of fracture extension. This also helps with surgical planning when you're looking at how many parts of the fracture there actually are. And MRIs usually aren't ordered, but we just put in here for completion's sake. Now, the all-important classification system, the near classification, is based on the number of parts of the fracture. There's the greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity, articular surface, and the shaft. You only consider a part if it is either more than one centimeter displaced or if it's greater than 45 degrees angulated. So let's go through this. First, there are the one part minimally displaced fractures. Next, there's the two part fractures. We're gonna start with the anatomic neck fractures. So if there's a fracture line through it, it creates two parts. There's gonna be the articular surface and the shaft. If it's through the surgical neck, you can have through the greater tuberosity, the lesser tuberosity. But what happens when there's more than one fracture line? That's when we get into the three part fractures. So you can have a fracture line through the greater tuberosity, then through the neck, or through the lesser tuberosity and the neck. And then if you add another line, you get four part fractures. And these are pretty much blown up. You can also have fracture dislocations, whether that be anteriorly or posterior dislocation. And these can also be two part, three part, and four part fractures. And you can also have of the classification if it's involving the articular surface. So knowing this classification is very, very high yield, and you'll be asked about it constantly. You'll also want to know this because it's very important when you're trying to describe the type of fracture. It gives the attending and residents a better idea of what kind of fracture patterns they're dealing with and what we're going to have to do for definitive management. Now, what do we do for treatment? This is another highly debated topic within the orthopedic world. Because treating proximal humerus fractures have been shown, if you treat it non-operatively, they still have very good outcomes. So, definite absolute indications for non-operative management. You're going to do these for minimally displaced surgical and anatomic neck fractures. If you have a greater tuberosity fractures that's less than 5 millimeters displaced, this is different than the other parts, that if it's greater than 1 centimeter, then you go to surgery. But just remember, greater tuberosities are different, and if there's less than 5 millimeters displaced, we can treat it non-operatively. But if it's greater than 5 millimeters displaced, we're going to treat it operatively. But if it's greater than 5 millimeters displaced, this does not make it a part. It's only a part if it's 1 centimeter. And if the fracture is in a patient that's not a surgical candidate. So we typically take these patients, put them in a sling for 6 weeks, we can start passive range of motion depending on how much displacement is in the fracture. We can get them moving between three days and two weeks, and then we get them back into active range of motion exercises after six weeks. So, operative treatment. In terms of operative indications, the fracture pattern is really going to dictate what we do. The options after we have gone down the operative route is to fix it versus replace it. In two-part fractures, the answer is more often than not going to be non-operative, but if you do operate, you're going to be doing open reduction internal fixation with a locking plate and screws. But the only exception to that is if there's a very displaced anatomic neck fracture and you think there may be a high rate of ABN and it's an elderly patient, you may choose to go just with replacement over open reduction internal fixation. Now for three-part and four-part fractures, it really comes down to age. If they are young, which is usually less than 60, 65 years old, then we will try and fix it over replacing it. Because once you replace it, you really bought it. So once you know your near classification of the fracture, then you can start going down the algorithm of how you want to treat it. So what are our typical surgical approaches when we're going to fix these? Well, we have the deltopectoral and the lateral deltoid splitting. We're going to go over the deltopectoral approach in the next coming slides. We're not going to cover the lateral deltoid splitting today, but just know that the most high yield thing here is that the axillary nerve is in danger when you're doing the lateral deltoid splitting approach as it crosses over the quadrangular space and wraps around the humeral shaft. So the deltopectoral approach. Your typical skin incision is going to start from the coracoid and go distally about 10 to 15 centimeters. 
Once you make your skin incision, the first major structure you have to be aware of is the cephalic vein, which will usually be found running within the delta pec interval. The cephalic vein can then be retracted either laterally or medially. Once the interval is found, you go through and you will see your conjoint tendon medially. The musculocutaneous nerve will enter the biceps about 5 to 8 centimeters distal from the coracoid, so when retractors are placed around the conjoint tendon, care must be taken to avoid injuring the nerve. Now, do you remember what the conjoint tendon is composed of? It's the short head of the biceps and the coracobrachialis. That question definitely will be asked at some point. You can also see the scub subscapularis at this point, and if we're going to be doing a hemiarthroplasty total or reverse, we will take down the subscap to enter the joint space. At the most inferior aspect of the subscap, we can find the three sisters, which, make up, which are made of the anterior circumflex artery and their two veins. And this is also another very common PIM question. Once the subscap is tagged and taken down off of the lesser, a capsulotomy will be performed and the joint will be entered. The anatomy you can see from here is the long head of the biceps, the axillary nerve, which runs just inferior to the glenoid. And oftentimes this is found, found so we know exactly where it is. So when we're placing retractors in our actual replacement, we know where it is and it won't be in danger. So knowing the anatomy of this approach is very, very important. And knowing the surrounding neurovascular structures and muscles will help you get not only points in terms of answering questions, but also make you more comfortable when going through this approach. So lastly, what are some potential complications of proximal humerus fractures? Well, we're going to start with if you actually go and fix this fracture. Screw cutout is the most common complication when dealing with open reduction and internal fixation when we put a locking plate and screws on. Typically when we have these fractures, there's a lot of comminution, and if the screws aren't getting as good fixation as we believe, then these are going to pull out without much resistance. Avascular necrosis, this is going to occur when there's damage to the blood supply to the head. However, this is not the same as humeral head ischemia risk factors with the fracture patterns that we saw earlier with the less than 8 millimeters of calcar, increasing angulation, and increasing head split fractures. These are different than what's going to cause avascular necrosis. And avascular necrosis of the humeral head is a lot more tolerable than when it happens in the femoral head. The axillary nerve is going to be the most common nerve that's injured. If we fix this proximal humerus fracture with ORIF, the most common fracture deformity that's going to be found is it's going to be falling into varus and apex anterior. Non-unions also occur, and they most commonly occur in two-part surgical neck fractures. And then rotator cuff injuries are common, especially in the elderly population. So let's wrap up that first case. So the case was a four-part fracture dislocation. And if we're going to go back and think about what is going to be the management of this patient, she's a 68-year-old female. She didn't have any prior rotator cuff injury. She didn't really have any arthritis or pain in her shoulder prior to this injury. So what are you going to lean towards? Are you going to fix it or are you going to replace it? Well, this is a four-part fracture. It's in a somewhat elderly female, but she didn't have any arthritic or rotator cuff problems before. So what we leaned towards uh, was a hemiarthroplasty where we actually were able to fix down the greater tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity and maintain her rotator cuff integrity. So I hope you enjoyed this and uh, we'll see you next time.